You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Good morning and welcome to Garibaldi Red, the Nottingham Forest podcast from Nottinghamshire Live. My name is Matt Davis, hosting as usual. and I'm joined today by BT Sport and BBC Radio 5 Live broadcaster returning to the podcast, Darren Fletcher. Morning, Fletcher. Are you well? Morning, Matt. Very good, thank you. Looking forward to this this morning. Nice to be on with a bit of positivity to talk about, which is always a good thing. I know your last appearance was right after Chris Hewson was appointed, and it wasn't looking too clever then. So no, uh, good to have no, you back. I was, I was I was pleading for patience then. I'm still pleading for patience now, but we are starting to see those green shoots of recovery and what things will start to look like over time. But as we said back then, it's not an overnight fix. It's something worth persevering with, and they've got a good man in charge who knows what he's doing. And given a a fair following breeze, I think he'll eventually get them to where they want to go. So um, I'm, I'm an optimistic person with regard to this situation at the moment. Absolutely. Uh, thanks. And our second guest is Lee Curtis from my colleague from Nottingham Live, who covered the game on Saturday for The Post. Lee, good morning. Are you well? Yeah, good morning. Just looking at Fletcher's haircut there, I think I should get his hairdresser, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hairdresser's cheap. <laughs> there's not a great deal of thought goes into it i'll be honest with you so uh well we'll start with you lee as you were making a guest appearance off the bench for the post um watching the game you normally cover Notts county what did you make of it from a forest point of view uh listen i thought forest got the job done i thought they were they were solid without being at their sparkling best i thought Millwall were pretty dreadful to be fair um but you can only beat what's in front of you and i thought for for large spells they were in control of the game um and they scored goals at crucial times. I thought Sammy Obi was very good. Uh, Ryan Yates, for me, was was probably man of the match. And the, and the two centre-halves, you know, so centre midfield and centre-back, they look very, very strong. Um, and obviously, you know, they, they conjured up a couple of worldies through, through Sammy and uh, it was enough to get the job done. But, you know, it was a, it was a good win. It was a good, solid win. There's now a, a six-point gap between them and the bottom three, which is, which is great. Seven games unbeaten, three successive wins in all competitions. So it's all looking pretty rosy at the moment. Were you actually impressed by Forrest Fletch, or was it more of a, a workman-like performance where they, where they beat what was in front of them? Were they, were they that good on the day or not? No, I, I, I was impressed. And I agree with Lee, not in terms of a, a sparkling on-the-eye performance. But I think when you score three goals for the first time this season, it's significant. I think when you make the game look as, as straightforward as they did against a team with Millwall's style is impressive and significant. And I agree with Lee. I mean, a lot of people focused at the weekend on the goals that Sammy Amiobi scored. The second one in particular was of a very high standard. I also thought that the corner that was worked nicely for, for Ryan Yates was a good goal too. But I was impressed mostly by... The central defenders, you know, whenever you play a team like Millwall, particularly when they send Matt Smith on later, you know you've got to win your aerial battles. And I thought Joe Worrell in particular, supported by Scott McKenna, were very impressive on um, Saturday. And I thought it had the look of the kind of performances you will start to get on a more consistent basis when Chris gets all his ducks in a row, worked out exactly what his best team is, gets in a couple of players that fit the way he wants to play a little bit better than maybe some that he's got now. And I think it's a little bit of a, a taste of things to come. And you've got to factor in as well that there's still that pressure at the moment of being at the bottom end of the table, being, you know, within touching distance of the bottom three. So that, of course, automatically subdues a team to a certain extent until they can build the momentum and get a decent gap where they can start to play with the brakes off. So I thought everything at the weekend was trending in the right direction. And whenever you look at a league table and Forest are six points above Derby, wherever that is, we all smile, we all laugh and we all rejoice. And I'll tell you something, I'd much sooner be in the Forest situation now with Chris Hewton and his staff as the manager with the group of players that he's got than down the Brian Clough way looking at Wayne Rooney starting out. We don't know what he's going to be as a manager. They look like they they, they need players. There's real issues behind the scenes. So I thought it was a good weekend on quite a few levels for the red side of, of this part of the East Midlands. I'm not going to say that um, Warren and McKenna are, you know, Burns and Lloyd or um, Walker and Chettle or anything like that. But do you see, Fletch, the, the foundations that Chris Hewson will want to build a team around in those two? 
Yeah, I do. And, and it's why I found the, the, the Shane Duffy stuff a little bit surprising last week, because I think, you know, when you've got a good central defensive pair and you've got Figueroa in there to back them up, you know, I think it's, 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 it's partnerships over the pitch, isn't it? And those two do seem to play quite well together. You know, Scott McKenna had a big reputation when he came down from, from Scotland in the summer. Celtic were looking to buy him. Teams wanted to pay a decent amount of money for him. And he's exactly the kind of centre-half you need in the Championship. He heads it, he kicks it. He's OK when he's on the ball, but he likes to do that physical, dirty stuff that you've got to do in this division when you're under so much pressure. And I think, you know, you've got a player next to him in Joe Worrell. The club means an awful lot to him. Yes, there's the odd mistake in there from Joe, which, which is a young player, so you've got to you know, expect and accept to a certain extent. But I really like those two, and I thought they were fantastic at the weekend against Millwall. And you can only judge them on what you see. Um, and, you know, it's there for everybody to see at the moment. If you look at the numbers, people are talking about this unbeaten run that Forrest are on now. Um, four wins and three draws. Um, if you look at it, They've only conceded three goals during that period, I think it is. So there's the indication that this team defensively is getting back to the kind of form that we saw last season. And of course, if they can maintain that ability to score goals at the other end, then it's going to make them a, a decent proposition for sides in the championship. So tiny steps, the strides are getting slightly wider, confidence is coming back. You know, and I think from this perspective, it's, it's starting to look good. You will have um, seen a lot more of Ryan Yates Lee than just on Saturday during his, his time well, on loan at Notts. I'm a big fan of his and make no apology for it. I think you are as well. I mean, mm. what did you make of Yates on Saturday and just the general progression of the player, Lee? Well, I, I think I said after the game, you know, I'd, it, it does. It, it, it's a little bit strange, to be honest, because I think people see Ryan Yates as this box to box number eight or, you know, think he should be registering 10 to 12 goals in a season. I don't think he's ever going to be that kind of player, to be honest. Um, you know, he's in the team, he's in it, he's in a, playing in a 4-2-3-1, he's, part, he's a holding midfield player. His, his job isn't to create, his job is to protect and serve, get it, give it, be a facilitator. You know, for the creative players to shine, you've got to have the ball winners and you've got to have the people who do the simple jobs in the team. And he does that absolutely superbly well he's got a fantastic attitude he's you know he, and he loves the club you know his, his celebration for the for, you know for his goal was, was absolutely wonderful so I, I really can't understand the criticisms that he does receive because he's not going to be that kind of player you know he, if people are expecting him to be some kind of poor man Steven Gerrard then forget it because he's not that kind of kind of player but you could see when he was on loan at Notts County just how good he was going to be um and obviously, when Forrest recalled him back, that that had a, a detrimental impact for for Notts because I think if he had stayed there, Notts would have probably gone on and got promotion because he was such a fantastic player in in the heart of midfield. There, brave as they come as well, um, puts his head in places where I wouldn't even dream of thinking put my head um, in places. So, you know, I think he's a wonderful talent, and it's no coincidence that if you look at the managers who have been in in charge of Forrest, Lamucci, Hewton, they love him. You know, and they, and Hewton in particular has worked with some fantastic young players over the years, has developed some great young players, and he can add Gates to the list now because I, I think he's what he's twenty three. He's not going to reach his peak until he's about 26, 27. Listen, it, he he will go on. He'll either go on and make Forrest a lot of money or he'll go on to be a very, very good player in terms of trying to help Forrest achieve what they want to do, which is get in the Premier League. If I can come in on that and, and on Ryan Yates, I, I would I would echo pretty much everything that, that, that Lee said. But what I would add to it is that in terms of his character as an individual, you know, I got to see him up close and personal behind the scenes when he was at Notts County. And the regard he was held in there and the attitude that he brings into work every day and the attitude he takes onto the football pitch every day is exemplary. One thing I noticed, I, 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 was, I was in the ground for a, a game a few weeks ago and, of course, there are no crowds in there at the moment, which is obviously very, very disappointing for everybody, but it does give you the opportunity to hear so much more of the communication from player to player, from, from um, technical area to player, and the amount of information that is passed onto the pitch via Chris Hewton to Ryan Yates is astonishing. So he's clearly a player that Chris trusts. He's got more than just a, a ball-winning role in the team. They clearly see the leadership qualities and his communication skills as something that is very important to the way the team runs. Everything that was relayed from the, the bench to the pitch 
was relayed through Ryan Yates and then passed on. And I think to give a young player that kind of responsibility tells you the regard that he's held in with the manager. And what I would say is that if you look around the Premier League and you look at a player like Scott McTominay at Manchester United, Scott McTominay plays a vital role in that team. And he's never going to confuse anybody with Paul Scholes or Roy Keane. Exactly, yeah. He plays a massive role in that side. And I can see Ryan Yates, as it goes, being that kind of player. I'm not saying Ryan Yates is going to be Scott McTominay, but in the Championship, in the Nottingham Forest team, I think he's going to play that role. And I think he allows the other players, the more creative ones, the opportunity to play. Um, and and I, I'm another one. You know, I think sometimes when you get a young player come through the academy, there's a real, like, always, there's a real sense of excitement because he's one of us. So all of a sudden, people are excited to see him. And I think when it's a central midfield player, you almost hope he's going to be Steven Gerrard or you hope he's going to be Frank Lampard. Yeah. When he's not, you're a bit more disappointed than you would have been for somebody else. But I think if people accept the kind of player that Ryan is and the role that he plays in the team and the value that he has to Chris Hughes and the club, then I think it will just you know, get everybody kind of on the right track to understand what he is, who he is and what he's going to be. And that is going to be, at championship level, a very important piece for Forrest. And I think he'll play more often than not. I can't see a better alternative in that position at the club at the moment than Ryan Yates. Hmm. I, I would go as far as to say, as I think for a player of 23 years old in that position, I don't think there's there's going to be many better you know, in, in the championship for his age at, at 23 to be playing for a club like Forest, playing that he does, manager like like Fletch says, you know, trusts him implicitly. So, I, I, listen, I, I think he'll go on to be a crucial part of the team moving forwards. Uh, absolutely. And listen, Chris Hewton's worked with some wonderful players over the years. And, and if he's good enough for Chris Hewton, it'll be good enough for Forest. Trust me. I made a pitch that might sound mad. Lee, you, well, you'll know, Lee. Is he more of a... Jordan Henderson type player in that he can be a leader and he's a bit more dynamic than a defensive midfielder or is that too much of a stretch? Not saying he, like Fletcher, I'm not saying he is Jordan Henderson. I don't think he passes the ball well enough to be Jordan Henderson. I think people underestimate the range of passing that Jordan has, but I think I think he's cut from the same cloth as an individual. You know, Jordan's yeah. a leader. Nothing phases Jordan. He'll always receive the ball in a, in a, in a, in a Brian Clough always used to say Scott Gemmell used to get criticised when he when he was in the side. And people would say then, the, the great thing about Scott is that whatever the score, whatever the circumstances, he will always have the ball and will always do his job. And it's a really underestimated quality and strength of a central midfield player. You never see Ryan Yates go and hide. You never see Jordan Henderson go and hide. And I think there is a, a big difference in terms of the kind of players that they are and what he'll be. But I think in terms of character, makeup, reliability, attitude, then it's a it's a fair comparison because you know it, it's not easy, especially when you're in a, a full stadium and you might be two nil down, and your job is to receive the ball in a tight area and you want to go and run and hide. A lot of players do go and run and hide in those circumstances, but I don't mm. think he's that kind of individual. And I think you will see that as the stakes get higher and the lights shine brighter. I think you'll find that he's he's mentally up to it. I mean, mm. I mean, you, you talk about his passing, Matt. I mean, he, he's he's twenty three. He, he he will get better with that. The, obviously, the more time he's on the training pitch. If I remember Jordan Henderson when he came to Liverpool, for example, it took him a long time to really establish himself, and now you're only starting to see you know, just how important he is to the team. So, you know, there's got to be a lot of patience with him in that respect. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I just, say, Lee, I just, so say, Lee, just on that, before you finish off, the, the caveat has to be that he has got, I think he has got a glass ceiling. You know, I think yeah. when you look at Henderson, he's he's mixing it now with the very best in the world in that position. I yeah. think anybody who's got the idea that, that, that Ryan might well become him, I think is misguided. But I think at the level he's at... yeah. The need that Forrest have is perfect. How much further he can go, whether he's above championship level, whether he can play in the Premier League, you know, whether he can kick on again remains to be seen. And I wouldn't be brave enough to stick my head on the block and say he can do that. Certainly at the level he's at, with the team he's at and the club he's at, I think he's a good fit. Mm. Is it a question I, here? I, I think he's perfect to play as a, a second holding midfield player. I, I, I think he's perfect for that role. 
There's a question here regarding central midfielders about um, Richard Ottaway saying how critical is Sam Bissau playing the quarterback role? I mean, is he better with Sau alongside him than, say, um, Colback or Arta? Is Sau's influence underestimated, do you think, Lee? Well, I, listen, you want, if you're playing 4 2 3 1, you're playing with two older midfielders. And I, I, it's obviously my first time seeing Sau. And Strong as an ox, you know, very, very, very imposing play. You know, Millwall were bouncing off him at, at, at the weekend. And, and he's got decent feet as well for for uh, for such a, a giant of a, of a man. But, um, yeah, I, I think for, for that role, I, I, I'm not sure what people expect when, you know, when the, from two holding midfield players. They're not, they're not in the team to, like, go and score 25 yarders. They're just in there to help protect the defence, and that's probably another reason why the Forest are, are so solid. You know, you've got McKenna and uh, and Warrell at the back there, and you've got two really tigerish, strong, imposing characters in uh, in Ryan Yates and Sam Bissau in front of them. So, in terms of how Chris Hewton sees the team going forward, I think that quartet... Are, are going to be absolutely crucial because, as Fletch said, they're not they're not giving many chances away. I think if the the only thing that you would say is, uh, for me, I would probably like to see Forrest be a little bit more braver in the final third. I, I, you know, if you look at the the shots on target in recent games, the stats aren't really sparkling. And I think after the game, Chris admitted himself he's looking to bring somebody in the final third, but. Um, so yeah, but in terms of those that that quartet and Sow and, and Yates together, I, again, it's it's another one of those positions where, you know, they have just a, it's a very simple role that it's not it's not a it's not an intricate role. So you know, for what they do, it's they're more than good enough. Yeah, I, I, I'm not necessarily sure <clears throat> that ultimately the, the the three that you talk about, um, whether it be Colback, whether it be Sow, whether it be Arta, I don't think that any of the three. Is probably the ideal one, actually. You know, I think the job that Ryan Yates does there, I think that's one area in the team where you could significantly improve it because I think it's okay playing with two holders, but I think one of them needs to have that little bit of a creative spark as well. And Samasau tried to do it at the weekend, but I mean, we're talking about a player at the, 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 the back end of the career rather than a player who's looking to, to make a mark. I think it's an area where you could improve that position and moving forward I think that would be an area that, they, that they'd like to improve upon and I think if you can get someone that has got a little bit more creativity next to Ryan Yates but has the discipline to to stay in his lane and do what he needs to do I think it makes Forrest better and I think it then also takes a bit of pressure off Cafu because I thought Cafu had a nice game at the weekend but I don't know whether you're going to get the consistency game on game to be that number 10 provider in a side that, as, as Lee says, you know, doesn't create a great deal. Um, so I think that is that is the area, you know, whether that's a big end to the season from Knockhart. Now he's here until the summer um, on the other side and who can be the spark plug, I don't know. But I think the next, the next phase of this now for Chris Hewton and his staff, he's sorted out the frailty. So they've stopped losing games. He's made them harder to break down. Defensively, the shape is a, a hell of a lot better and it works. Now I think he's got to work out how he makes them more inventive, give them a more of a cutting edge at the other end of the pitch. But I think it goes in stages. You know, I don't think you can do it all at once and you can't do it overnight. The fact they got yeah. three this weekend is a step in the right direction. Having said that, they won't get the two Amiobi goals on a consistent basis like that. So that has to bring a little sense of realism to it. But... You know, I think that's going to be the next phase now. Can can the club go from being nice and solid, don't give anything away, really difficult to beat? If you want to get out of the championship, you've then got to add that ability to score goals at the other end. And when you are against an inferior team, you've got to be able to take it to them. So I think it's it, it's next. You know, it's next. And I think that midfield area, who plays next to Ryan Yates as, as the second one, is a, is, a, is a key position for them. Mm -hmm. um, where do you stand on Cafu then? I mean, as a number 10, I, I think they kind of need to move the ball a bit quicker, a one and two touch, like we saw with Brighton at the weekend. Just one touch can open up the whole field of play. Is, yeah. is Cafu good enough to do that, do you think? I've, I've, seen him, I've seen him play live twice. And the first game, I, you could have taken him off at any stage. And then at the weekend, I thought, well, he's, he's grown into the role. I think if you're going to play as a number 10, you need to play 
in a team that's playing with a bit of confidence. There can't be anything worse than being the number mm. 10 in the team when you never get the ball. And mm. uh, when you, you're losing matches and you're so focused on not conceding goals, the number 10 almost becomes the lost position. <laughs> you know, you, you're so deep. Yeah. Oh, get the, but he's picking the ball up in no man's land and there's nothing he can do with it. You saw at the weekend that when they were able to get men forward, where they, they are able now to play with a lot more confidence, all of a sudden he's got more options. So whether he played better at the weekend or whether the team around him was functioning better, I don't know. But he had a decent game at the weekend. And if he can play like that seven times out of ten, then he's going to be a, you know, a good player in that position for Forrest. But I I'm still not certain yet whether it was him, Lee, at the weekend or the performance that gave him the opportunity to play like he did. Well, I, I mean, I think Millwall, to be honest, I mean, they were pretty dreadful. I, I mean, it, it, I know you can only beat what's in front of you, but Millwall just so passive. I think Gary Rower, after the game, went ballistic at the performance and said they didn't turn up until the last 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so perhaps maybe that might have contributed to why Cafu. But listen, there was a moment in the first half where he played a, a, an immense through ball to, to Lewis Graben in the first half, which underlined perhaps what he is capable of in, in that position. I, I think another thing when we when we talk about Forrest and scoring goals, I'd like to see them take more risks personally. I think they've got to be a bit braver in around the final third. Sometimes it can be a little bit too safe. Um, and in terms of players' movements as well, I think there was a moment in the first half where Ribeiro's put a cross into the six-yard box. OK, might not have been accurate, but you're looking at who's in the box. There's four Millwall players, and I think it was Graben and Amiobi had, had tentatively had just stepped over the line into the penalty area, not even gone beyond the penalty spot. So, you know, you're not going to hurt teams like that. So I think that's something that, that perhaps they, they, they can work on. Um, but in terms of the number 10, whether Cafu's a long-term solution there, I'm not so sure. I think he'll probably do a job in in the, in the short term. Um, but I, I think, you know, Chris will probably be looking in the transfer market to to bring a uh, somebody in. Could knockout play there? I'm not so sure. I think he's more of a direct winger. Um, so, but they're, they're difficult players to find as well. That, that's another thing. Is not there's not many good number tens about. So yeah, you, Lee, as well. When I see a good one, I think they're rhythm players. You know, you see yeah. number tens and they go through periods in a season where they look unplayable, and then you go and watch them later on, and, and you don't see a great deal of them. And I'm talking about you know, the other best number tens. You yeah, know, the Champions League. I think that they're rhythm players, and I think if if Forest get on a run and they become a more attack minded team and they start to play off the cup a little bit more with a bit of confidence then that position is easier to play. So I think, you know, it, it's 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 chicken and egg. It's one thing needs the other. I don't think in yeah. a bad Forest performance, Cafu's going to drag him out and win the game. But I think he's got the ability when they are playing to a certain level that yeah. he, can, he can be an important piece. And we see that a lot, of the, a lot of times in that position, you know, whoever you are. Yeah. And I, 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 another thing I did notice as well, some of the crossing into the box can be improved a lot. Um, I mean... Ribeiro and Christie got into numerous good positions, but a lot of them were just scuffed, you know, just... Yeah, I think that's the big weakness, mate. I, I, I think it's a huge weakness. It, any level in the modern game, the supply from the fullbacks is vital because of the way teams set well, up... the way the game's gone, hasn't it? It's the way the game's gone, gone, yeah. Yeah, if you... I mean, the, the best team in, in, in Europe last season had very adventurous fullbacks. Now, I'm not saying that Forrest ever need to look like Bayern Munich, but... There is a method and a recipe. And I look at the, the delivery from the fullbacks. I see the amount of ball that Christy and Ribeiro get around the opposition box. And then I look and think, how many of those crosses really caused a problem to the opposition? How often did you go, what, what a ball that was? When did they manage to you know, put it in the area yeah. where you're begging a centre forward to go and tap it in? Yeah. How many times did they hit the first man? It happens a lot. And I think that's the area where, you know, if... If they can get those two playing better, I think that 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 has to improve. I'm, I'm yeah. with you on on, on the, the full defensively fine. I haven't really got too much of a problem, but at the other end, it's yeah. such an important part of your attack now. I mean that 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 was something I did Im Im immediately pick up on. Uh, you know, j just the quality into the box. You know, and in terms of the wingers as well, they don't, they don't supply many crosses into the box either. You, if you look no, at they're the, all narrow forwards, aren't they? If you think about, yeah, them. I mean they come in on the off the touchline. I get that because that's what you know. You've got Martin, who's a right footer playing on the left, and you've got Amiobi, and the, the you know the job is to come inside. I get I get that, but sometimes you need the fullbacks then get round you and yeah. deliver. 
quality. Otherwise, that's right. Yeah, but sometimes I'd, I, maybe he could probably switch it up, stick Ami Obi on the left, just to just to give something a little bit of a different option. Um, but you know, when you're looking at Lewis Graben, I think he scored two goals. I think he had two shots on goal in, in the entire ninety minutes on, on Saturday. Now he's a good centre forward. He's, he's proven throughout his career what a fantastic goal scorer he is. But for him to thrive, you've got to give him better service. It's all right, people saying, "Well, Lewis Graben's not not scoring." But if you, if that's the example of the kind of service he's getting, he's getting two chances, and I'd probably say only one of them really was was one he could have scored. Then that that sort of underlines why he is perhaps struggling in front of goal this season. I think what Lyle Taylor's got four. So mm. you know, if moving forward, if Forest are going to be one in a position where they're challenging for the Premier League, they've got to sort the top end of the pitch out because. Scoring goals is the hardest part of the game, but players like Lewis Graben, who have proven in the past that they're capable of scoring 20 goals, you know, it, I think the service has got to be a lot better. And that, that's something that Chris is, is definitely going to have to work on. But I think, again, this all comes with the caveat that if you put a manager like Chris Hewton into the football club, you then say to him, right, go and build it. And you can't yeah. put time scale on it because yeah. the track record tells you wherever he's been, not only does he get the success that the club is hoping for, but when he leaves, he leaves a football club behind. He's a, he's a club builder as well. And I think that's important for Forrest. I, I think if you look at it, a lot of the transfer policy and the way they've gone about the recruitment is it looks a little bit scattergun from the outside. It's flawed, but, isn't it? Yeah, and, and you look at the, the turnover of managers, that they're always dealing with a group of players that they probably wouldn't pick. So now you've got a manager who needs to sort out the players that he wants compared to the ones that he doesn't. And he's got to be allowed to replace them organically over a period of time, not rush it so you can get the right ones. And then you've got to allow it, got to allow it to happen. And I think, you know, you look for progress and you look for improvement. And since Chris Hewton's been the manager, there has been improvement and there has been progress. But Chris Hewton's forest will play vastly differently to Sabri Lamouche's forest. Now I watched them against... Um, Swansea earlier in the season and Sabri wanted the team to sit. He wanted the team to soak up pressure and then he wanted the team to counter and that he wanted to win one nil and it worked last season really well. Come back after the lockdown. Didn't quite go as well. Maybe teams had worked out a better method to play against them. What Chris was trying to do when he first came in was get them to press from the front which is an entirely different way of playing football. So yeah. straight away, you're saying to a group of players who you've been asking to sit in for a year, that now you've got to go and press. And I remember watching it thinking, when you watch a pressing team press, they press aggressively. You know, they all, they, they, they've got the trigger point and they go and they're fully committed. And I watched the team against Swansea and they kind of half-heartedly pressed. Didn't really want to go because they weren't quite confident mm. what was going to happen. And that left a lot of space in midfield and they lost the game. So I think there's, there's, there's not only, you know, people need to be aware that they're not just going to play a way. Even if the, they might be set up in, in the same shape, there might be a different method of, of, of how they want to get the points out of the game. So this is going to take a little period of time. Defence looks a lot more solid. Stop conceding goals. Stop losing matches. Had a good game at the weekend. The confidence is growing all the time. He's understanding more about the players that he's inherited as he goes. He's seeing the good side of them and the bad side of them, and he's starting to work them out as characters on the training pitch day after day. But this is going to take a period of time. And this season won't be about looking at the table and saying, oh, they're only 15 points off the playoffs if they get a good run after the year. It's nothing to do with that. This is about consolidating this season and Chris working out what he wants to do in the summer so they can hit the ground running next year. And even at the start of next season, it might still be a bit of a work in progress. But, but when you have a manager like him, my belief is, you have to then step back, let him use his experience and his ability. That's why you put him in in the first place. If you wanted a quick fix, you would have done a Watford and taken a punt on a fella from overseas who might have won 10 matches on the spin in Spain. But they don't. They want to build something that can be sustainable, can last, can get them into the Premier League and then potentially keep them there. So that that has to be now a patient approach. And, and everything – I, I – I don't see, I might just be Mr. Optimistic, but I don't see a great deal of negativity from what Chris has done since he's been there. I think players are playing better. He's getting more of a tune out of individuals who were really struggling in the early weeks of the season. And, you know, the first thing is let's not lose. And once you've worked out how you do that, then you can think about starting to win. And, 
you know, this recent run has showed that they're not losing games now. So you would expect maybe with an addition or two in January that they can finish the season better than they started it and put themselves in a position to hit the ground running at the start of next season. I mean, I think it's going to take two. I think it's going to take two transfer windows. Probably, I'd probably say it's going to probably take two years, I think, before no, you... Well, it's go, it's Managers don't get out. two years, do they? But it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, You've got to get them out. That's the hard thing. It's not just yeah. about putting players in. We can all sit down there with a piece of paper. Oh, and yeah. Go, yeah. I'll take that one, that one, that one. And I'll get him on loan. And then you think, oh, we've got 45 players. Yeah. Because then you've got 25 turning up on a Monday, knowing they're not going to be involved on Saturday. The atmosphere is terrible. So mm. it's it's not just the getting them in. It's getting the ones out that he doesn't want. And that that takes time. That takes time, patience, creativity. All these things, Lee, doesn't it? And he's got to yeah. be able to do that. Yeah. I, I, th I think the, the, the biggest problem, I mean, it's, it's great for us as the media when Forrest is signing players left, right and centre. And I think, what was it, 15, 16 signings and thinking... You know, and the fans are loving it. It's like, oh, who are we bringing in today? But actually, <clears throat> when when it all settles down, you've actually created more problems for you than it's actually solved. You know, if you look at uh, Iano's already gone back, and um, you know, there's talk about Guerrero going back to uh, going to Greece. Um, so you know that transfer policy and how they do their recruitment, I think, is probably a conversation uh, for for another day, really. But you know, they have to revise that because bringing 15, 16 players in at a time isn't good for morale, I don't think. Uh, I think it will cause ruptions in the dressing room. Um, when players aren't involved, I think you'll find... Uh, I mean, we had it at Knott's, there were 30 or 45 players. Players tend to go into the cliques. You know, those who aren't involved all start to go together. And all of a sudden, the manager's striving for unity in the dressing room. And all of a sudden, you've got five or six who just want to be left on their own. And it's it's not ideal. But I think moving forward, you know, if, if they give Hewton enough time, which I'm sure they will do, hopefully... Um, it'll probably take about a year, two years before we get to where he feels the team can be. I mean, I asked him after the game on Saturday, how far away do you think? And you could just tell, you know, yeah. not yet, a long way away. Yeah, because because he wouldn't, if you, if you sat down with him, I'm sure, and we've not been privileged to do this, but if you sat down and wrote the squad list down and say, put a tick next to the ones you'd have chosen and a cross next to the ones you wouldn't, they'll have a lot more crosses on that list than tick. <laughs> It just, they just would, you know. What I mean, it's just that's just the way it is. And, uh, yeah. and also as well, I don't think this is all going to be a nice, steady progression. I think there will be one or two bumps along the way as well, where they go through a little spell where you think, "Oh, hang on a minute, here we go again." And they're just going to ride that through, you know. He, his track record tells you that he's a good manager. His track record tells you that he, he gets where he he wants to get to. So mm. now you, you've made the decision to bring him in, and now you've got to let him get there over. Mm the right kind of time period and yeah 100 percent agree with that yeah you you've talked about building um is he the way he's managing Mighton? is he handling him really well in terms of dipping him in and out of the team or should he be playing him a bit more i mean obviously he did what he's done well in two games against millwall now is there a point with a young player where you have to let them off the leash or should he keep uh drip feeding him into the team do you think you know what? I, I spoke to liam o'kane about this and I, and I said to liam i said what i said what is it i said because you it's all right putting these young lads in i said because you know you can you can think well you know he's worth a go and, and liam stopped me in my tracks and he said that was the best thing about brian clough he said brian was really really good at knowing when to put a player in but he was even better at knowing when to take him out. And that's the trick, isn't it, with a young player? They've got ability. It's why they're in there in the first place. Some of them can go into a first team at 18, 19 and never come out again. You know, Trent Alexander-Arnold being the, the prime example. But most of them, you know, need to be managed in a certain way. Um, and Chris will have all the experience of the world with regards to when to take Alex in and out. And the, the good thing about it, the beauty of it, is there's a, a fantastic relationship between the academy and the first team. So, you know, Gary Brazil is in there giving his feedback and he knows Alex better than Chris at this stage, both in terms of what he's capable of and maybe what he's not capable of. So that relationship is going to be really important. You know, Gary Brazil's influence and, and, and experience of, of Alex Mighton as an individual, I'm sure will be relayed into Chris Hewton to give him you know, as much information as he can have to know when that is. But again, you know, Alex might be one of the exceptions who can go in and play 
pretty much the rest of the season. Really enjoy it, do really well, and then come back in the summer as one of the key pieces for, for what next season's team might look like. But it is that balancing act between when you put them in and when you take them out, and you've got to get that right. And sometimes the fans would look at it and you'd, you'd think, well, that's, that's a crazy time to take him out because he's playing so well. But that might be when the manager thinks he needs a bit of a rest now to come out the firing line and just redress the balance and get everybody back on the same page and then go again. And, and more often than not, they only come out the once. They go into the team, they do well, they come out, and then when they go back in again, that's it. They're off. Take the armbands off. Take the L plates off. That's it. So I don't think it's going to be an in-and-out scenario for, for Alex Might and if his performances are consistent, but... There might just be a time where he comes out for a game or two and then goes back in and kicks on from there. Mm -hmm. the, the other player I wanted to ask about before we move on was Amiobi. I was going to say he's a bit of an enigma, but enigma to me just means inconsistent. So is he he's out of contract in the summer? Is he a long-term option for Forrest or is he someone who has served a purpose and if you're going to kick on, you probably need to say you know thanks for your service and shake his hands at the end of the season. Tell you what, if he plays like he did Saturday, he'll be he'll be here, he'll be here next year. Don't worry about that. I know that's the thing, though, isn't it? That's Five that's games before that, he wasn't so good. Can you get a tune out of the big man? I don't know. Mm. Well, well, listen, now he's got a wonderful left foot. Um, actually, you know, if you look at him, I know he's played a career as a winger, but you look at him towards the latter stages of his career. Could he play as a number ten? Could he play as a number ten? You know, I, I, I think he's got he's got he's got a wonderful left foot. Um, I think he's know. got to work out whether he can play as a number seven consistently first. Which <laughs> he's not worried about anything else. Yeah, I mean, I think long term, if you're at, if you want, listen. If I'm looking at Forest, and to be brutally honest, I think they probably need a bit more athleticism out wide. If I, if I'm being if I'm being ultra harsh, I think they need a bit more speed, bit more power. If I look through the team, you've got Sal. Yates, McKenna, Worrell, very strong. Cyrus Christie's okay as a, as a fullback, but if you look out wide, you probably want a bit more dynamism and a bit more pace and a bit more up and at them. If I if I if I'm being honest, but I think listen, I think Ami Obi's more than good enough to to yeah. be a part of the squad for a lot, for a bit until they sort it out. I think it's an interesting thing that you that you raise about the inconsistency because I think when you look at the Forest attacking players you would put most of them in that category. And I think when you when you want to be a successfully consistent team, you can have maybe one or two in the side that are a bit up and down, that when they're on, they make your team outstanding. Yeah. But when they're not, you, you can probably get through it and you'll be okay. But I think when you look at the Forest forward line, Graben's not a consistent scorer of goals. You know, he scores goals, but you can't, put your house on him to get you a goal again. You look at Knockart, who's been in and out since he came. Alex Mighton's a young boy. Cafu has been up and down, inconsistent. Mm. Amiobi, inconsistent. You can't have that entire forward line no. on or off. You've got to have a certain number in the team that are a steady 7 out of 10. And yeah. then that allows the other ones, when they are going, to turn the 7s into 9s. And then you had a really big performance from somebody else in there and you're irresistible that day. I think Forrest's issue at the moment is that, that the whole front line is on or off and you, you don't really know what kind of consistency you're going to get. And I think that's holding them back. But we saw at the weekend, Cafu played well, Amiobi played well and, and they go and score three goals against Millwall. But there's no coincidence that that's the first time they've scored three this season. You know, they mm. do find it hard to score because they don't get consistently good performances from the, from the front players. So I think yeah, that's I mean, I, I, many I, I, issue. Yeah. I mean, I had a look at the stats of the weekend. I think one shot on target in the game against Preston, three against Cardiff, and I think five at the weekend. And if you take away the goals, of course, um, and I think you mentioned it earlier, if you take away Amiobi, two out, two long rangers, you're not going to get them every game. Oh. You know, what you Ryan Wakes was from a set piece. Piece. Think about it. Three goals, two, two, two cracking goals and a set piece. And they yeah. play well. So yeah. It shows you where they've got to get to. You know, the goal wasn't being peppered by any stretch of the imagination. No. no. It was a good performance by Forrest. So it still shows you there's a bit of work to do at that end of the pitch. Yeah. And then so, I think I think the grabbing goal at Preston was obviously a penalty. So the numbers aren't aren't great. And I can understand why Chris Hewton is is 
probably desperate to get one or two in in the win before the end of the window, creative players, just to see if they can unlock something at the top that, you know, so they aren't having mid periods in games where they're sweating a little bit, like they could do on Saturday. They go, well, go off and kill the game. They can go into the final yeah. 10 minutes, you know, get the slippers on, get the cigars out. You also get that situation, Lee, when you're in a team and you know you've got a player that can change the game for you because he's on it. The, the yeah. confidence that gives everybody else. It means you can ride out, you know, the, the rough spells and away you go. I always think about the QPR team that got promoted with Tarapt in the side. They could do anything. Yeah, during- a maverick. It was yeah. a maverick, wasn't it? Yeah. He was gonna he was gonna win the game at some point for you. Yeah. You, know, you get players in the championship who he was another one, the lad at, at Tramir that went to West Brom. Um Kumas. Kumas. Yeah. Jason, you had Jason Kumas in your team in the championship. You knew that he was gonna win you X number of games, pretty much on his own. So yeah. When you get a play with that ability, uh, the, but, but they're, they're of that level in the championship, makes a massive difference. You know, you yeah. see lads at Norwich at the minute who played in the Premier League last year, you know, talking about 20 odd, 30 odd million quid for Buendia. You put him in the championship and you know that he's going to win the first share of matches for Norwich this season. And if he doesn't, Todd Campwell will. Now, if I look at the Forest side, and I know they've been in the Premier League for a season, but if I look at the Forest team, you don't see match winners like that. No. You know, no. you look Bournemouth team at the minute, the players in their side, the Watford side, Ishmael Asar on a going day is going to destroy teams in the championship. Yeah. And Joao Pedro is another one I saw him play against Man United in the FA Cup. Good player. Too good for the championship. Yeah. You know, Forest don't have those players, I'm afraid. So everything's more difficult for them at the moment. And that's, that's the level, the standard of player they've got to be looking to get in if they want to be able to compete with the teams that drop out of the Premier League because that's your big problem. Look at the sides who are going to go down again this year. You know, Sheffield United, if it finished now, Fulham and West Brom, straight away they'd be the three favourites to go back up next year because the difference yeah. in the standard of their squad compared to everybody else, giant enormous. So yeah. for yeah. folks to get there, to get out, they they can't just bring a, a group of lads in and galvanise it all together and we'll be OK. You've got to have that quality in the team. And at the top end of the pitch is where it's so important. And I think over the, the course now of the next transfer window or two they've got to go and find their best striking options attacking options that they can build the team around it's okay being solid at one end but you've got to get the goals at the other yeah i think that's, that's, that's where their recruitment that, that's where their recruitment strategy i think really does need to have, have a bit of a a, a a rethink they've really got to sit down and, and i'm sure chris will have a major say in that but i, I think moving forwards in the long term because what they've done so far hasn't worked you know no, they spent a fortune on they probably spent as much money on 14 players if, if they bought three really good players yeah made a huge difference eggs in those baskets then they might be in a different position i suppose which is what they probably need to do now i guess let's um move on looking towards the next game um on the up, but Forrest are facing Middlesbrough next, who are always a very tough opponent managed by Warnock, uh, coming off a bad result themselves. Lee, you'll be doing this one as well. I mean, uh, is this another opportunity for Forrest to win or are Middlesbrough the proverbial wounded animal under Warnock? I'm always a bit wary of, of, of teams that, that are managed by Neil Warnock because, you know, he'll have them revved up. Um, they've got, I think Dun- Duncan Watmore has been a, a fantastic signing for them. I, Ironically, I think in the in the summer when I did a story about wingers who were available on free transfers who may be worth a punt, and I, I, I stuck him in because I thought, um, you know, he, he's one of those. He's he's diminutive. He's quick. Two good feet. Great in the Premier League. Just had a few injury problems, but he's gone into Middlesbrough and he's absolutely flying. So I think he's going to be a player that that Forest are really going to have to keep an eye on. But you know, like like Fletch said it early on, the the, the, the the team looks very, very solid. Um, my only concern going into that game is is the goals. Where are the goals? Where are the goals going to come from? Who, who's going to have that magic touch? We had it on Saturday with, with Ami Obi, and we obviously had Yates from the set piece. But you know, who's going to be in there and, and creating chances? You know, that's something that, that Chris Chris has got to work on for that game because you know, if you're not at it, not at it against a Neil Warnock side, you know, you will get turned over. I mean, Warnock's last five jobs, I think, have been his last job. He keeps saying he's going to retire, and he keeps he keeps delivering the goods. Is he out of all the managers who manage in the championship? Is he the best one of all time? Do you think? I don't know. The all-time best championship manager. Yeah, 
Yeah, with his record of getting teams up, I mean, would you have had? I, I've always well, said I would. Record I, would have had it, but I think I would actually. Attorney, so so I worked with Neil at BT Sport for a period of time, and he said to me when we first launched seven years ago, he said, "That's it, I'm finished." And then I think Sharon, his wife, <laughs> on the backside he was around the house. <laughs> it was with Sharon's encouragement that he went back in for one last job, and then he's been taking everyone since then, and. I, I, I'm not speaking out of turn, but I'll tell you this for, for a fact. He's always wanted to manage Forrest, always. And he'd tell you that himself. And he came really close to doing it. He rang me in the car one day and he'd essentially come down to take the job. And it didn't go well with Fawaz while he was here. And last minute he went, no, I can't do it. And it was over how the team was going to be picked the following night, Neil wanted to go straight in, select his team. Um, and I think he was told um, that, no, you come in the day after, we'll look after it tomorrow. Because I think the owner fancied picking the side himself <laughs> that night. And Neil said, no, no, no. He said, I'm either coming now or I'm not coming at all. And in the end, he said, I can't work like this because there was too much interference at the start. Not from this regime, from the previous one. Um, to the point where he'd even got players um, who were going to come and, and play for him. He'd already spoken to players who were going to come in at that point and play. So he's always wanted to do it. He's always wanted to sit in the same chair that, 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 that Brian sat in. He fell in love with the place when he was across the river at Notts County, and it's always something he's wanted to do. So he's going to be extremely motivated when he comes here for the next match because he's got a soft spot for the club. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's as good as anybody in terms of getting teams out. Not necessarily sure that they're too frightening a prospect, though, are they, Middlesbrough? They're quite similar, I think, in a way to, to what we see from Forrest. Yes, they've got, you know, they've got they've got what more is a talented player who would be in the Premier League now if it wasn't for those injuries that, that Lee talked about. But they're not really a team to, to strike fear in the hearts. I mean, I'm relatively confident that Forrest can certainly keep them under control. Yeah, they're quite similar to Millwall and Cardiff, aren't they, from the last two games? It might bode well for Forrest. That that style of play, to be fair, might suit them. They, they seem to just go in fits and starts, don't they? Because they're, they're hovering up around the top six, I think, at one stage, and then they dropped away a bit. So it, 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 he'll have them revved up, won't he? You know, like, like Fletch says, but having come so close to, to getting the job before and, and being in a position where they were actually talking about giving him it. You know, he'll probably want to have a, a, a point to prove. But um... one of the players he was going to bring, I can't remember his name. He was at, he's at, he was at Cardiff with him. Liverpool, he started at Liverpool, fullback. Peltier. Peltier. Peltier was, Peltier was coming in that day and was going to be in the team the following night. That's how far down the line. That's right. I do remember. I do remember. It must have been about six or seven years ago, was it now? Yeah. Lee Peltier was coming in and was, was actually in the team that Neil had got in his mind. That's right. He was yeah. in the team that they was going to pick. Peltier was playing the following time. <laughs> <laughs> That's how close it was. It was right there. And then, and then it all it all went all went wrong at the end and off he went somewhere else and Forrest is still in the championship. But there you go. I think if they start they just start the game well. I mean that's what that 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 was what Forrest did really well on Saturday. You know, they started well, immediately found a little bit of rhythm. Um very, very strong midfield, quickly won the ball back. Cafu, for instance, I know you're talking about leading the press early on. He was the one who was leading the press. Him and, him and Graben, it, it did tail off, I've got to admit, the longer the, the game went on. But, you know, they got a foothold in the game. Um, I mean, we were all dreadful, but for that opening 30 minutes, Forrest were in complete control and then they ended up get, getting the goal. And they've got, they've got to try and do the same again on on Wednesday night. Well, there's mm -hmm. answer me this, right? You know, when we talk about Cafu, do you think it holds him back because he's called Cafu? <laughs> well, because he's not the Brazilian right back. He's in the wrong position for a start. Right back. That's full back you've seen, you know, on that side of the pitch. You yeah. imagine, if, imagine if the left back, Ribeiro, was called Maldini. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it helps Cafu, the fact he's called Cafu. You imagine, <laughs> imagine if... Imagine if Lyle so called Maradona or is that well, LA? Yeah. All of a sudden you go, oh, because we've all said it. We've all yeah. said it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it helps. I've got to be honest. 
This is for his full recruitment strategy, isn't it? They just need to go and find a bloke who calls himself Messi and they'll be laughing then. You're out there scratching your head thinking, I can't remember Cafu playing like this. Aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it helps. Um, before we finish, I wanted to talk about quickly about the FA Cup. Um, I, you probably can't say it's pointless this season. Fletcher's a broadcaster who's probably covering it. But it does feel to me, this of all seasons, it does feel a bit pointless with no no fans watching. Should it even be being played this season or not? Do you know what? I, 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 I'm really disappointed because I thought the third round, in terms of the ties that were drawn and the ties we got, yeah, brilliant. It was brilliant. It mm. was another third round, as we've had for ages, and nobody could be there. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any reason why you wouldn't play it. You know, it's, 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 it's like saying, well, would you play the Premier League and the Football League? You can play the games. I mean, it's fine. And, and you, you hold out hope. But by the latter stages of the competition, you know, people can be in the ground. I think from a Forest perspective this week, you know, they go to Swansea. It's away from home. It's not the be-all and end-all this season because, you know, with the greatest of respect, they're not going to win the FA Cup. But it's a chance to go away, test themselves against the decent championship side, have a look how far they've come, bearing in mind they lost to them at the city ground a few weeks ago. It's an important fixture for them, not in terms of FA Cup, but in terms of progress, um, it'll be informative. It'll give Chris the chance to give one or two other players that haven't had a chance, an opportunity to play, maybe prove a point to him. So I think in Forest's case, it's quite an important game on, on, on a lot of levels. And of course, you get the situation that if they did get through, the odds are they're going to get Manchester City at home in, in round five. So that'd be good. Mm, true, true. Um, I wanted to give you the last word, Fletch, because last time you were on, you mapped out the rest of the season and so far you've improved pretty correct about steady progress under Hewton. So, um, I don't know, talk up the next few months and what you, how you think it's going to go for Forrest. I, th I think it'll it'll be more of the same. I think you'll, you'll, you'll start to see Forrest become a very, very solid team, which, which we're seeing now. Um, you will see his best 11 emerge because he'll work out the players that he can rely on. I think over the next few weeks, you will see one, maybe two attacking additions to his team. <clears throat> and I can foresee them finishing mid-table, slightly above, nice bit of momentum to take into the summer, and then real optimism that if he has a decent transfer window at the end of this season, that you know they can, they can make some progress next year. I, I, I just think it's trending up now. And I think when you've got a good manager like him, when it does start to trend up, it very rarely tails off again. So I think they're a club on the move. There's a lot of work still to do for him. But, you know, I think optimistic is, is the way I'm looking at it. I think they've made the right choice. I said it when he came. I'm convinced he's the right man for the job. Um, and I think over the next two or three seasons, you know, it really can kick on and become a successful period for him and the club. Well, we certainly hope so. Thanks very much for joining us, gents. And thanks to everyone who watched along. We'll be back on, uh, well, next week. But I'm recording a special episode on Wednesday with one of the legends, which I'm very much looking forward to. So uh, thanks me. for your time. Fletch, very much appreciate you coming on <laughs> once again. I'll tell you what I have noticed since I've been sat here staring at Lee, since he's let his hair grow. He looks like <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Do you know what? I was thinking exactly the same. I'm looking yeah. at him. It's slightly getting bigger, isn't it? Yeah, you like Michael Sheen. <laughs> the finest character actor of our generation. You, you could be playing all kinds of parts if you carry on. You'll be starting. <laughs> I wish I had his money. Uh, yeah, you should have seen him last week when I did one of the. I did did a video with him last week. He looked like I'd just been fetched off the street or something. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I've seen him. <laughs> <laughs> well, gents, thanks very much for your time. Very much appreciate it. We'll be back next week. And we hope everyone stays safe in these difficult times. And we shall see you all soon.